you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week will go a long way. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. The Lord has just brought me and my attention in this morning for the next few minutes that I have with you. The Lord has brought it to my attention that uh, there's just some areas where I feel like that we've experienced um, things as Christians, believers, that have caused us to maybe not live in the fullness of what Jesus has for us. And it's my hope and sincere prayer this morning that this would be a blessing to you. It was a blessing to me. But Jesus said this in John 8, 32. He says, for if you embrace the truth, it will release true freedom into your lives. Jesus said, if you embrace the truth, it will release true freedom uh, into your lives. So the word true there means something that's like reality, that it's not made up, it's not counterfeit, it's not just an image, it's, it's reality. So Jesus said, if you embrace truth, that reality will completely set you free from anything that's counterfeit or it's not an image, and it will bring true liberty or freedom into your lives. You know, there's so many things in the Bible today that talk about who Jesus is, and yet in our culture, it seems like here in America, we have a lot of times that people are uh, worshiping a Jesus that's not the biblical Jesus. You have, uh, there used to be back in the 80s and 90s, especially out of Central America, they had it a, a liberation theology, which was Jesus was a Marxist, and Jesus was for the poor people, and Jesus was against people who had any substance, means, or wealth, and so liberation theology took hold, and that was an abnormal picture of who Jesus was. You have, uh, coming up today, you have a lot of people who believe that Jesus is, um, uh, that Jesus is just kind of like, uh, like a new age kind of Jesus, like he's, there's many paths to God, and that did, Jesus is not the only way, and he's all-inclusive. There's no hell. There's no penalty for sin. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no right or wrong. It's just pretty much what you want to believe. And you read in the book of Galatians that the Apostle Paul tells us over and over and over again, if you follow a gospel other than the one that you've received, he says you're under a curse. That's right. And I'm here to declare to you that Jesus is the absolute Lord, that Jesus, in the way the Bible describes him, he's not a Jesus made in your image. Uh, it seems like we have now in our, in our country, in the United States, that we have a Jesus that is... Um, portrayed as like a Santa Claus Jesus and that uh, Jesus is like portrayed as this gentle kind person who will give you everything you want and I'm here to say to you he's absolute Lord uh, it's his will and the last time I read the scriptures it said he chose you you didn't choose him and I also read that it says that listen to this that you were created for his purpose you don't create him for your purpose and sometimes we get it different. We think we're the potter and he's the clay. And it's just the opposite. And you have to let God mold you and shape you. And we watched this and when we did it with uh, the potter's house, uh, Dr. Of, what's his name? Everybody look Ferris. at me. Everybody freak. Dr. Ferris. Who? Ferris. Dr. Ferris. Thank you. God help this morning. Uh, Dr. Ferris, well, he takes this mold of clay and he just works it and works it and builds uh, like a little vessel of something he's going to make, a dish or a pot or something. And then if it's got a crack in it or a flaw, he reworks it. He but puts it all back down and does it again. And so I've seen the Lord in my life do this many times where there's little flaws or cracks. And the Lord says, I've got to readjust you. And so I believe as you're all going with the Lord, walking with him, the Bible says you go from glory to glory. You go from strength to strength. You go from old wineskin to new wineskins. Wasn't that fun singing that song about Jesus on Christ the solid rock I stand? Yes. You know, when I grew up, that's all we sang were hymns. And now since I've been in the charismatic movement, all we do is sing choruses. But every once in a while, it's just fun to go back and Amen. sing some of those hymns and just worship God and love God. So I would hope that as a community of faith, no matter what setting you're in, that you can worship God, whether it's a hymn or whether it's a chorus or whether it's Bethel music or whether it's a Hillsong or whoever, that you just have a great time 
letting God just come and minister to you as you're singing to him because worship is from the heart. Amen. It's not just in the mind. It's the heart. So I just want to encourage you as you talk about this Jesus that remember, he's not made in your image. You are made in his image. So having said that, uh, speaking of Hillsong, many of you know that the founder of the Hillsong movement, a guy by the name of, of Brian Houston, uh, got into some activities which weren't appropriate. But I read with interest some of the things that he talked about, and he talked about that ever since he'd been in ministry, that uh, he'd been taking medication because he was so nervous when we'd get up to speak. And he talked about he used sometimes alcohol and pills and things to try to sedate his nerves. And I find that interesting because of this, is that addiction can hit anybody. Right. It's not just for the people who are just out on the streets, it's people who are in the church. Right. Uh, when you go through and you look through all the different things that uh, create uh, conflict in people's lives, they find ways to medicate themselves. They find ways to uh, try to get through life. And so I found these scriptures that I thought would uh, be appropriate to what we're talking about this morning, which is simply the revelation of freedom that Jesus wants us to be free. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12, 1. It says, for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. Talking about the people out of Hebrews 11, the chapter of faith. It's a, the, hall of, the hall of faith chapter. It says, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that we so easily fall into. Then we, able, then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out before us. So what the Bible's telling us here is that we have to let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that we so easily fall into. And I would submit to you that a lot of times people get wounded and out of the woundedness, they fall into sin. And so as a church, we're quick to look at the people who are sinning, but we're missing out on the woundedness. That's right. And the Lord wants to deal with the roots. And the, one, the Lord wants to deal with roots that are in your life. He wants to get you free. He wants you to walk in health. He wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to walk in purity. He wants you to walk where you can be free from addictions. Kenny Shelley Miller that run our Celebrate Recovery Ministry will tell you this, and most people will tell you this a lot of times that before you're five years of age is when a lot of people get wounded. Uh, I just read this story. It was just interesting to me because I was focused on this and preparing for the message. Is uh, in uh, GQ, I didn't read it, just saw the headline, but there was a famous movie actor named Brad Pitt, and he talked about he was celebrating two years of sobriety. And he said, ever since college, if not before, he says, I've just battled against feeling lonely, so I used drugs and alcohol to medicate myself because I didn't want to feel lonely. So he attributed his addiction to some woundedness that was in his life. Right. You could go through these things. I remember just my dad telling me the story of my, of my Uncle Billy. My Uncle Billy, at 13 years of age, my grandmother had been divorced, remarried, divorced. You know, somebody in the 20s that gets divorced and remarried and gets divorced, I mean, well, that's, that's not good for in the culture and the society we lived in. That was looked on very, very poorly. And uh, so the stepdad was there with my Uncle Billy, and he told my grandmother, her name was Inez. He said, Inez, you got to make a choice. It's either me or him, this 13-year-old rebellious kid. One of us has to go. My, ma, my grandmother still had other kids in the, in the house, which would be my dad and my aunt. And so she told at 13 years of age, my Uncle Billy hit the road. So Uncle Billy was a street kid growing up, and he spent the majority of his adult life in prison. So back towards when my grandmother was about to die, she was in the nursing home there in Pensacola, Florida. My Uncle Billy came to visit her, got right outside the door, this hardened criminal who'd gotten free and got, actually gotten saved and God done amazing things, and he was back in prison preaching and ministering to people and sharing. I mean, just a... Incredible miracle, one of the highlights of, of my dad's ministry is seeing his brother come to Christ. But Uncle Billy could not walk into the room where my grandmother laid on her bed because he was so full of rejection. He just couldn't get over it. Couldn't go and face her. And I'm just thinking his whole adult life, he suffered because of that wound. 
He had no one to help him, no one to cure him, no one to speak the word, no one to bring deliverance, no one to bring hope, no one to say, Billy, we can get you free. We're going to pray. The Lord's going to do some amazing things, go back in your life and get you free. And so you see a lot of times, as, as, as they say, is a healthy mind, that the healthy mind buries subconsciously into our subconscious unhealthy moments or memories. Right. And so without the help of the Holy Spirit, you just grow up feeling a certain way, acting a certain way, doing certain things that uh, you don't recognize as not being you. You think it's always been you, and it could have always been you, but it really wasn't you. It wasn't the real you. Or let me say it this way. It wasn't the you that Jesus designed for you to live. Amen. That it's, it's not reality. It's not truth. And so the Lord wants to set you free. So I've got another verse here in Hebrews 12, because how does, how does this happen? It tells us this. It says, these heroes, 12, uh, Hebrews 12, 13 through 16, these heroes all died still clinging to their faith, not even uh, receiving all that had been promised them. But they saw beyond the horizon the fulfillment of their promises and gladly embraced it from afar. Listen to this. They all lived their lives on earth as those who belonged to another realm. Let me just pause here. You belong to another realm. Amen. You don't belong to this realm. Come on. God has set you apart to live this life in a different realm. Amen. And I just want to encourage you this morning. That's the realm of freedom and love and joy. For clearly those who live this way are longing for the appearing of a heavenly city. And if their hearts were still remembering what they left behind, they would have found an opportunity to go back. But they couldn't turn back for their hearts were fixed on what was far greater, that is, the heavenly realm. That's why I want your attention to be on God's desire is for every person to walk in freedom and liberty Amen. and wholeness, to walk in that heavenly realm. So because of this, God is not ashamed in any way to be called their God, for he has prepared a heavenly city for them. The Bible tells us many times throughout the scriptures about this other realm. If you just read the book of Revelation, it talks about all the times that the apostle John was caught up into another realm and he saw things and heard things and experienced things. There are people in our midst who've had visions and dreams and encounters with the other realm. And I'm here to say that, that realm is real, it exists, it's vibrant, it's alive, it's pulsating with life. The Bible tells us out of God's very throne room there flows a river and this river is for healing of the nations. This river is for the healing of individuals. This river is for a healing that God says it produces fruit uh, 24-7, 365, 12 months a year. That this river just flows and just brings healing, healing, healing. So everywhere it goes. You and I have tapped into as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, as people who are his children, his family, we have tapped into that river. Amen. The river of healing, the river of life flowing through you. However, a lot of times in our life encounters, things happen which cause a woundedness and cause us to lose our freedom. As I've noticed as I'm getting older, flexibility I have to work at. I'm not as flexible as I used to be. I went and had a, played a golf tournament last weekend for Father's Day, had my son come up, and you know, when you're, you know, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're just more flexible than people who are in their 60s. You just, you just have to work a lot harder. That's why if you ever know anything about golf, they have this place, they call it the advanced tees, I call it the old man tees, because, because of flexibility issues, they need you to get closer to the hole than the other people to watch him play. Well, you know, as you can imagine, as you're growing up, the Lord has for you a destiny. He has a purpose. Right. And Satan, his role, his minions, to try to knock you off that purpose. On. One of the greatest tools that Satan uses to nail us and knock us off our path is rejection. When you get rejected, it could be by your family, it could be in school, maybe you were bullied, it could be in sports, maybe you had a coach in school, maybe you were bullied, it could be in sports, maybe you had a coach. And I remember speaking of the golf tournament. Nate Stupar, who was the founder of the golf tournament, State of Hope, shared that his college coach told him, you will never make it to the next level. You will never be a professional athlete. 
So he spent seven years proving his coach wrong. Amen. But you can't let that rejection come in. You see rejection take all forms. You see rejection come in where people have, like in marriages, you know, spouses begin to reject one another. You see it with parent and children. People begin to reject one another. My younger brother, who died, uh, died at a young age, at 40, uh, 46 years of old, age, uh, when he passed away uh, in a car accident, but he battled drug and alcohol addiction. Why? Well, one of, the, one of the main roots was rejection. We'll talk about it next week. The other root was rebellion. And I can just tell you that stuff just comes out. Sometimes babies in the womb feel rejected. There are times where like maybe the, the mother gets pregnant and they're like, oh, I don't want to have another kid. I just don't have the money, don't have the resources. The dad and I are not doing well. And the baby picks it up that it's not wanted. So all your life, you go through this thing that you're not wanted. And I'm here to tell you that that's not God. Amen. That's not the Holy Spirit. That the Lord wants to come and just set you free and deliver you. Well, how do you get that? It's by revelation. It's where the Holy Spirit just illuminates and just reveals to you. That is what the problem is. Ah, I see. Because deception is all about being in the darkness. In other words, hiding things so that you don't catch uh, up with or understand or see what's going on. You have a lot of people that just are in tremendous conflict where they get rejection and their feelings, quote, get hurt. And that woundedness is there, and it just goes on and on and on. They never get healed. But you know, the Bible gives us a promise. The Bible tells you now, and I thought this was a great verse. Many of you know this, but Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, it says this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Everybody say it with me. Say, heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Those are powerful, powerful tools that God gives us as believers. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them, listen to this, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. You know, all I can tell you is that that root of rejection has an incredible ability to taint everything you see and taste and touch. It could be from your dad. It could be from your mom. It could be from your siblings. It could be in school. It could be in sports. It's, it's just an incredible, incredible uh, device the enemy uses to beat people down. In fact, one of the words Dennis had for one of our staff was just about this woundedness and that, you know, you just get wounded through because you're opening up your heart and you get wounded and there it is. There's been times, I've, I've, there's been times I have disappointed my children. There's times I've disappointed my wife. There's times I've disappointed myself. There's times I've disappointed the church. I can go through over and over again. There are times that people have disappointed me. And if you allow yourself to get wounded, you will miss the purposes of God and what he has for you, to, for you to walk in total freedom. Amen. And what I'm hoping this morning is that through me trying to communicate to you and with you, is that if you have a desire, all of a sudden you have a recognition that something has come in, maybe at an early age, Holy Spirit reveals something to me, show me something, the Lord will set you free and you will never again be bound by that rejection. Hallelujah. You will never have that influence your life and your decisions. So I was reading this book uh, by the famous My Pillow guy, Mike Liddell. I mean, you've heard of Mike Liddell. And it's called uh, What Are the Odds was the name of the book. And he talked about the guy's got, you know, two, 3,000 employees now. My pillow's doing great. And they, got, they still got battles going on different things because of his political views. But he talked about his life journey where he spent his whole adult life with a cocaine addiction that uh, transgressed or went forward, uh, got greater into crack cocaine. He said he was up for one time. He shows a picture on a, the cover of his book. He was up for 14 straight days. In fact, he was such a bad addict. Think about this. He was such a bad addict in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area 
that the drug dealers came and the drug dealer told all the street guys, do not sell him any more drugs. He is so bad off. How many know that's pretty bad? Yeah. When you're trying to buy your drugs and the drug dealers are told that you do not sell him any more drugs. And so he's going through his whole life. So here he is, he's been divorced. They went through all this mess with his kids. Uh, he was hanging on to his dream. Other people tried to steal his business from him. I mean, the whole book is just one big, man, it makes you just, you feel like you're out of breath listening to all the stuff he goes through. I mean, he was in these very bad neighborhoods, buying drugs. He got, I mean, it's just incredible just the amount of time that he took to feed his addiction. So in the middle one night, he's up, he's up, and he's up in the middle one night, he's there, he's going through his paperwork, and God gives him an idea, and he writes down six pages of notes for the whole what became the My Pillow. He goes to the uh, he goes to put it together. The next morning, his sister calls him. Listen to me, his sister calls him. And she said, What were you doing last night? And he goes, Well, I was just, you know, like in bed. He'd taken his coke and crack and stuff and I mean, and she said, well, she said, in church this morning, the pastor called me forward and said, do you have a brother named Mike? And she said, yeah. He goes, well, I've got a word for him. Last night, God gave him a download, and he's not to let go of it. Wow. Tell him to hang on to what I gave him. So she's on the phone, Michael, what did God tell you? Michael, what did God tell you? What did God give you? What did God give you? He's like, I don't know. I don't, you know he's, all, <laughs> he's all nervous about what was going on. But he had six pages of notes that he felt like God said he would use his platform for the my pillow to have a pillow that would shape your head and it'd be comfortable. And I've had conflicting reports. Most people say they're good. Some people say they, but uh, anyway, but anyway, so the my pillow guy, so he just came up with this thing and manufactured here in the U.S., all this kind of stuff. But here's what happened. He was trying to give his life to Christ. He'd gone through multiple relationships. He's trying to serve Jesus, and he just can't because he's got all this woundedness. So they did a retreat for military people with PTSD, and they invited Mike to come. So he went to it. He didn't want to go, but I won't go through the whole story. So he goes, and in the three-day retreat, God speaks to him. Listen to this. This is so critical. God speaks to him, and his sister had told him, he said, Michael, you're going to find out your drug and alcohol addiction are caused by you when you're in your childhood. He's like, nah, nah, I'm not, you know. And all of a sudden, he remembered when he was five years of age, that's when his parents divorced. And he realized he'd always had this need because he felt the rejection from his mom and his dad. And it fueled his whole life style of cocaine, alcohol, and then crack cocaine. Ruined his life. But in one moment, he said he was there. He said they had him in this, in this seminar to visualize. He says, can you remember the moment where the woundedness came in? And he said, yes. He said, now what is Jesus doing? And in that moment, Jesus came into the room Right when his mom and dad were telling him, we're divorcing, we're leaving, and Mike Lindell saw Jesus come in and bring healing to his heart. And today he's free for how many years of sobriety, no drugs, no crack cocaine. Amen. God's doing some amazing things. He's sitting at the table with President, and then President Trump talking about all this stuff. And I'm just like, he could have avoided so much misery if he'd have let Jesus speak to him way back when and reveal to him what he wanted to do. Does everybody follow this? So what I'm going to ask is the music team to come up. We're going to see what the Lord wants to do. We'll have a ministry team that's here. They'll be here. But I just need you guys to take just a moment. Just ignore everybody else moving around. They have permission. But if you guys would just be still for just a moment. And bow your heads. And obviously, I'm hoping as I've been speaking that the Lord's been talking to you about areas where you've had some woundedness in that area of rejection. I could go through a lot of other issues that uh, deal with rejection, but I feel like these are good examples. I've lived it personally. I've been through it. I understand it. 
that root of rejection is one of the most strongest forces you have to deal with. So here's what I encourage you to do with our heads bowed, eyes closed, just between you and the Lord, because I can't, I, I don't know your situation. I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and he's going to set you free this morning. But I would say here's, here's like the uh, five steps you need to take. Number one is we're going to confess any known sin. So between you and Jesus, if you know there's any known sin in your life, this is the time to get it out. This is the time to tell the Lord, I'm sorry, I've been looking at pornography. God, I'm sorry, I've been doing drugs. I've been doing, you know, medical marijuana or any other excuse. God, I'm sorry that I've been doing these things. And you just begin to confess any known sin. The second thing you do is after you confess is you repent. That means you turn from it. When you get free from something, you don't want to go back to it. Jesus told an interesting story. He talked about a guy that, that got free from his demonic uh, oppression or possession. This is in the spirits who went away, and then they came back, and they found the house swept, clean, and in order, but the house was empty. So repentance is where you turn from that activity. You don't go back to it. The third thing you need to do after you confess and you repent is forgive others. Maybe you've been ripped off. Maybe there's somebody that has just done you wrong, and this is your moment that you need to forgive others. The fourth step would be to expel, which is breathe out. That's all the word spirit means, breath. So we're going to stand up in just a moment. We're going to stand before the Lord. Get rid of our woundedness, the rejection. We're going to breathe it out. We're going to be free. We're going to walk as, and walk in the liberty and the freedom and the truth that Jesus designed us to walk in. And the last thing is you make Jesus Lord of your life. You're going to make a confession that Jesus is my Lord over every area of my life. I'm not holding on to any one thing. Every part of my life is under his lordship. There's not any area that I'm holding on to for myself. So as we've been standing before the Lord, this is what the Lord told me to do, and I'm just trusting that it's what he wants to do. I don't have to know every issue in your life, but I'm telling you rejection is demonic. Rejection is from the pit of hell, and that woundedness will cause you to live a miserable, miserable life. And the Lord wants his people to be free. The Lord wants his people to be able to breathe freely and love freely and give freely and not have hurts and heartaches and hang-ups and habits that just create all kinds of misery in your life. There's some things the Holy Spirit has spoken to me, specifically in this area of rejection that I want to get rid of, I want to be free from, I want you to stand. This is your morning, this is your time for the Lord to set you free. He's going to do it. I'm telling you, Jesus is going to do some amazing things. Mike Liddell took three days of a retreat. We've got just about 20 minutes here that we've gone through this, but this is between you and the Lord. So I want you, all, those of you who are standing, my eyes are, 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 my head's about eyes closed. I'm just, I'm just standing with you. Ask the Lord to reveal to you, if you already know what the area is, I want you right now in Jesus' name to forgive the situation, the person, the people that you feel the rejection from, those who've not claimed you, those who made your life miserable. It could be a school teacher in school. It could be classmates laughing at you over something. It could be, there's just tons of things that are out there. And the, and the Holy Spirit's highlighting this to you because he sees that he wants to make you free in this area. It's not going to impact you anymore. It's not going to cause you. As you go forward from this day forward, you're going to be free from that. I want you to make a decision to forgive, release, That's it. And I want you under your breath to name that person. Lord, I forgive Billy. I forgive Susie. I forgive you. Just, you just begin right now. You're beginning to release them, the ones that have caused you woundedness. Could be parent, parent, spouse to spouse, spouse to child. Could be distant family and near family. Could be people at work, athletics, all these places. We're standing before the Lord. I know my dad spanked me one time for an unjust action that I think was unjust, and I was right, he was wrong, and he apologized for it, but it created for a woundedness, and uh, I'm just here to tell you, I've had to go back to my children and repent for many times, I've said things in anger and harshness uh, to them. All right, so after you've forgiven, you've released, we're not going to go to the next step. 
which is simply to expel. So I want you to, as I begin to pray, you're going to take a deep breath. And this is what I teach you all the time. We go through deliverance, and you're just going to expel this thing. So, Father, we stand before you. We're asking for forgiveness for others. We're asking forgiveness for ourselves. We're holding on to things. And, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I want you to take a deep breath and just ex exhale. Lord, we are releasing this woundedness. Thanks. We are releasing this rejection. We're releasing, uh, if you would, the curses that have been trying to come against us in Jesus' name. Thanks. Take a deep breath. You start feeling a lightness. You start feeling like it's, got, it's free, it's over. The devil always works in deception and hiddenness. And this morning, we're believing that God, the Holy Spirit, has exposed, revealed things deep down inside. Father, we thank you. We thank you as we just breathe out. We just release. We release that rejection. We release that woundedness. We ask you that you'd come and heal us. Father, we've repented. We've turned from it. We've expelled it. And now make a declaration. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord. Every area of my life, everything I touch, everything I do, Jesus, you are the absolute Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Christ, that was a great way to do it, to say, Jesus, thank you. I accept your free gift. Thank you. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me, release me, cleanse me. Jesus, I ask you to fill me with your spirit. Spirit of God, come. The Holy Spirit, if you guys would do me this favor, you'll just hold your hands out again. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. We don't want to have an empty house. Come on, come we don't right. want to have a house where we just got rid of stuff, only for more stuff to come. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd fill us. Thank you. We ask in place of the rejection that your acceptance would come, that you, Jesus, would come on the scene. Thank that you, Jesus, would come and just liberate us and set us free. That Thank we'd walk in that freedom. We'd walk in that acceptance. We'd walk in that vitality and life that you've given for us. Thank you. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. If you believe it, give the Lord a big hand this morning. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Amen.